Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics and this is part two of our Williams Whitewater Pinball Repair. In part one we did uh, some electrical repairs and then the time came to clean up the play field. Now I want to emphasize that the importance to me of fixing a game like this is making it electrically and mechanically perfect and spend some time on the uh, cosmetics. Nobody wants to look at a broken, dirty game. But I'm not aiming for super uh, quality here. I want to get the game to the point where I can play it. That is my major inspiration for doing this. So I'll probably take some shortcuts on the cleanup and maybe get to that at some later time if it needs more. But uh, let's have a look what was done so far. So you're looking at the underneath of the play field. Uh, I went through, fixed a bunch of solenoids, broken wires, stuck switches, uh, some fixes that were uh, uh, made by uh, previous owners of this machine that were just plain wrong. Some switches didn't work because the, they had removed and rerouted wires and uh, none of it was overly difficult. Pop bumpers needed to be fixed. Uh, lights were burned out or weren't coming on properly. You notice this really big hole over here and we'll get to what that is later. Now changing our viewpoint. More towards the top of the machine. More solenoids flippers of course, switches and switches and bulbs and switches and on and on it goes. So it got cleaned up pretty nicely and running through the test routines everything that is still hooked up from the bottom of the play field, anything that I can test, switches, solenoids and stuff like that, all seem to be working. Now one example though of having a clean machine is so what you're looking at here is a ramp that runs underneath the play field and uh, let's see can we see the whole ramp here almost but what happens here is the ball falls from a hole in the play field into here and this uh, ramp is tilted that way and we don't call them ramps when they're under the playfield, but we call them subways. So what happens is the ball falls here, it rolls this way and interrupts these two optos which tell the ball that the which tell the game that the ball fell into the whirlpool, which is what's on top of the playfield. And then it rolls over here and uh, it slides into what is called a vertical up kicker which is right here and in the vertical up kicker, up kicker there are more optos here the ball drops on top of the solenoid interrupts the uh, optos and the solenoid kicks the ball up vertically out back into the play field. Now the problem with this was well it wasn't really a problem but when you when you clean up a play field and you put like new rubbers rubber rings on it and all that good stuff is you want to make sure that everything is clean on the play field so the ball doesn't just carry the dirt and smudges everything and the interesting part here was that this subway was essentially opaque black it was so dirty you couldn't look through it I mean yeah see you can see the pointer nicely now after taking it out and scrubbing it clean but what this what things like this would cause was basically the ball no matter how clean the play field is the ball rolls through this picks up all of the dirt and kicks it right back onto the play field and happily proceeds to smudge everything so we're okay on the underside now I think but let's see what the play field itself looks like 
Oh, and there is another thing I want to point out first. One of the things that was stolen in here, I say stolen because, anyway, it's an integral part of the game. You see how the play field's leaning up right now against the back box? It also has a position where you can put it at a 45 degree angle. And in order to do that, there's supposed to be a prop rod down here so you can bring down the play field and it rests in one of the indentations here. And that way you have the play field at a 45 degree angle and you can simultaneously work on the top and bottom of the play field. But the prop rod was uh, missing. So uh, that's why I have a piece of PVC pipe here that kind of precariously balances the play field. I'm going to have to uh, get a piece of steel and uh, redo the prop rod, but that was just another one of the surprises that I got when starting on this game. But to show you a little more detail under the play field, there's one driver board, there's another one hiding behind the wires. There's uh, the PCBs that actually hold the lamps instead of a lot of lamps are mounted individually, like over here, but uh, to get some savings and make it a little bit easier to build the play field, there are PCBs for the plain purpose of holding lamps. All of the uh, solenoids, the ones with the green uh, solenoids are the pop bumpers see the ball trough with several switches and of course the flipper assemblies and a dead light bulb I wonder is it dead yes it is so missed the light bulb there I must have replaced like 50 or 60 light bulbs on this thing so far but uh, yeah there you have the uh, playfield underside in all of its glory. But before we go to the top of the playfield, quick look at the uh, front of the game. We're looking at the back of the coin door. It has two coin slots with the uh, coin mechanisms in silver in there. I think these are set up for quarters right now. Bunch of buttons, which is the operator user interface to get you into test mode and there's quite a few options you can uh, you can tweak for the game and of course uh, test switch closures, solenoid operation the display which we saw last time and, and a bunch of other things so what we're looking at in the middle of the picture here is the tilt mechanism it's very complicated and the way it works is so we got the plumb bob here it's got the green wire going to the top and a white wire going to the to, to the frame that it's hanging in and when you shake the machine too badly it starts swinging and it completes the circuit between the green and the white wire and that tells the machine that you shook it too hard and it'll tilt and penalize you by uh, basically dropping, basically disabling any scoring for the current ball. Other things are there's a slam tilt switch there. And if you look at that, it basically the front has a weight on it. Where'd it go? And uh, the way that works is if somebody gets angry and picks up the machine and drops it on the floor. It also signals the computer that something happened, but this is a different signal. This is the uh, the slam test, uh, the slam tilt, and the penalty for a slam tilt is that it's game over immediately. Game over, man. And there's a few safeguards like that in there. There's also a slam tilt in the coin door, and that's for those people that love to kick coin doors, whom I love dearly. 
and uh, here's the interesting part. So normally there's there's a mechanical coin meter in here, and uh, normally the machines don't have it. It looks to me like that was necessitated or prescribed by the uh, Japanese authorities for a machine like this. And if we look at the uh, meter, it says that this machine accepted is that one? 118,240 coins. So, uh, I guess in terms of quarters, you divide that number by four, and eh, if we round up to 120,000, that's basically what? 30,000. Well, 100 and 120,000 quarters, which equates to $30,000. Somebody made out with a band, like a bandit with this machine. But it's still in surprisingly good shape for a machine that has that much, that high a number of plays. So if it spent most of its life in Japan, I guess Japanese pinball players are a little bit more polite than American ones. So here's the top of our play field. It is currently in a mostly nude state. Because I pretty much pulled everything off it. I have done some work on it. I mean this lower part, the flippers have been cleaned, the play field has been cleaned, these plastics were replaced, rubber rings were put on, but uh, if you remember, there was a lot more stuff on this playfield before. The uh, some things we can test. I can't. I can't really start a game because it's going to complain about things missing and not enough balls being in there and all of that. But uh, remember the subway we talked about. So this is the hole that the ball lands in and this is where it gets ejected. So yeah, the subway runs from here to there, so if we drop it in here, boom, there it comes out. I could also do it in this one. The problem is this one has a vertical up kicker and I don't know where the ball's gonna end up without any ball guides, so I won't be trying that, but if we go into test mode, it actually enables certain things on the play field for you to test. The flippers work. Uh, let's see. The pop bumpers should work. So that's all good. And, uh, and yes, you can uh, actually go in and test the switches. <coughs> So, for instance, yeah, just regular targets makes a noise and actually tells you what the switch is. Then we can see there's a pair of optos here, and as you move your finger through it, it tells you that it's there. And then some rollover switches and just all sorts of stuff, but you can test to see at this point to make sure that switches work before you put all of the ramps back in. I mean most of the switches are accessible from underneath the play field but it's always the one switch that is completely obscured by play field toys that tends to go bad. So where's all the stuff uh, that goes on this play field? Remember the big hole in the play field? Well this is what goes over that hole. This is a mini play field that uh, that mounts slightly above the normal play field and uh, here's Bigfoot had to clean him up uh, give him a, a teeth cleaning because uh, he looked like a something addict with all his blackened teeth but there's another flipper on here this has been cleaned the flipper rebuilt new rubbers on here everything cleaned up there's a mechanism on here that basically lets Bigfoot 
divert the ball. There's like two two ramps it could go to when the ball comes here, and depending on his mood, he will push the diverter forward and make the ball take a different route. And uh, so this one, yeah, here's a picture of the uh, rubber rings I've removed in various colors and in various states. And the interesting thing is, for instance, these are supposed to be rubber sleeves, like these black ones over here that bounce nicely. These are half petrified. There's not a lot of elasticity left in them. And these yellow ones are completely pe petrified. I mean, the ball would just kind of stop dead when it hit these. So the game should play a lot differently with all the new rubbers. And for the remainder of the parts, we have all the ramps laid out here. I've started cleaning some of them. I've numbered them and put the, all the uh, appropriate screws in the little bags or not. So I can, uh, so I know where to put them. One interesting thing here is that the pop bumpers, you normally have little pop bumper caps on them, but in this game, they're actually covered by mountains. For example, this mountain goes over this pop bumper. Let's see, is that right? Yeah. Goes over there. Then, that's the wrong one. Then we have covers for all the other pop bumpers too. Okay, what is this triggering? Oh, that? Okay. But yeah, this one goes over here, but this one's had a volcano eruption. The ball took the top clean off, so I'm going to have to repair that. And let's see, there's another one for this one. Let's see. And that one goes on like this. This one's also had a volcano eruption, so that's also going to need some fixing. But yeah, there's more mountains that cover the rest of the play field, and the ramps, of course. And it's it's going to be a nice jigsaw puzzle because the ramps they actually came off in an order that made sense. The problem here is that a lot of them have switches on them, like this, and the switches have wires that need to go underneath the play field. And for instance, what happens when once I install the mini play field over the big hole, it kind of covers up these holes, which the wires are supposed to go through. So that kind of makes it a little game of... Uh, putting a lot of things in place but not bolting them down so you can route the wire so you can lift them later on route all of the wires to go to the bottom of the play field and then tighten the screws and you got to be careful too so you don't cover up certain screws with other ramps or whatever so you can get to them and actually tighten them I have some notes on it but of course I got too bored and I didn't keep complete notes so uh, it's going to be a fun uh, it's going to be a fun exercise putting all of that back together again correctly of course believe it or not i got the play field put back together again it took me a while the uh, interlocking nature of the ramps and cables leading through little holes to the bottom of the play field made it a little bit difficult of course, after I put it all together, I found a page in the manual that told you how to remove the mini play field in about very fewer steps than I actually used. But then again, I had to take the whole thing apart anyway. I had to get all the ramps off. There's a way to lift off that mini play field with most of the ramps still attached to it, which is risky because you can break stuff, but I guess it's a quick and easy. But as I was starting to play test it, a few problems surfaced. And the first one was Bigfoot had an accident. 
There he is. He looks uh, happy enough. But what happened is his hand got amputated. How'd that happen? Well, his hand, remember, is the one that pushes the diverter forward, like this. And I guess this got caught on something. His arm, his fur got caught on something, and the fur just kind of came off. Well, not the fur, that's his arm, actually. So uh, I used a couple of different kinds of glue, and it failed immediately, came off again. So uh, I brought in the heavy guns, used some gel super glue, uh, probably uh, exceedingly large amounts of it, but uh, put it in there and gave it a little hospital tag so we know who the patient was. And now is the time to take the tag off and see if he's cured. So uh, not for the faint of heart, don't watch this if you can't see things like this, but uh, here we go. Okay. And looks like it's sticking. Well, we won't find out till later when we actually play a game how permanent the uh, permanent super glue is, but looks like that part's fixed. But there was something else prevented me from playing this, and we'll have a look at that. So what happened is actually a pretty common problem in uh, the uh, in these in the Williams pinball machines when they get older, and that is that the power supply, things wear out in the power supply, but uh, you know this one's pretty extreme because the whole machinery sets. And after doing some research I found that it has a uh, 5 volt watchdog on the CPU board, which the CPU board is over here. And, this, and the main driver board, of which you can see the top half of over there, supplies the 5 volts to the CPU board. When the watchdog detects the voltage, I think it's about, uh, when it goes below 4.75 volts, which is, I guess, considered the uh, lower end of the safe operating voltage for TTL, the watchdog kicks in and uh, activates the reset line on the processor. And the game starts, the machine starts all over. And uh, as you can imagine, it's pretty annoying. And, uh, and it had to be fixed. Now, an additional thing that I noticed that I hadn't really paid attention to in the machine was that there was clearly a an aftermarket mod installed and consisted of if I get to the back of the machine here it consisted of these two capacitors screwed to the top of the uh, back box with a wire running to the back of uh, this capacitor over here which is the smoothing capacitor, the pre-regulator pre smoothing capacitor for the 5 volts. So obviously this was a problem that the machine must have had before and somebody figured, oh the cap's too small, let's just put more caps on there. Now, the cap it normally has is a 15,000 microfarad cap, which you can see was replaced but the old one was still there, it actually measured fine, but what they did is they took two 22,000 microfarad caps and they put them in parallel with this cap, basically quadrupling the capacitance on this thing. And uh, I guess for a while that worked, but you know, it was a band-aid at best, and obviously it stopped working, even though, interestingly enough, both of these 22,000 microfarad Sanyo caps tested good on the tester. 
but you know we can't uh, we can't just band-aid this so after a bunch of analysis and measurement uh, I found that one of the bridges underneath this heat sink over here had a uh, had an open leg basically the diode one of the diodes had opened it was the 5 volt the uh, bridge that uh, fed the 5 volt regulator and even after replacing that it still was acting up so there really isn't that much more left in here I replaced the 5 volt regulator and I also found a burnt resistor a small burnt resistor back inside here that was sitting on the output from going from the output of the regulator to ground which obviously signaled some malfeasance and a small cap that had opened but once I replaced those I think the problem went away and uh, obviously we'll have a look at it but uh, whoever came up with this mod uh, no comment But a little more explanation is in order. I don't, I don't think I made it clear that the first thing I did in the 5 volt supply, I replaced the original 15,000 microfarad capacitor with a new one. And it was still acting up. So, so anyway, the, the, that seemed to have gotten fixed. But exactly why does it do this when you hit both flippers? And I think the reason for that is that... Uh, when you hit both flippers, they draw so much current that the transformer, which isn't exactly over uh the voltage of all the secondaries sag. And I guess if the, uh, if the voltage regulator and the smoothing capacitor and everything else in the 5 volt uh, regulation circuit is not up to par, the voltage will drop between not between, but below 4.75, or whatever the exact lower cutoff is, and reset the CPU. Now also it uses a, uh, the uh, voltage regulator used the, uh, what is it, the LM323K. It's not, it's not exactly a precision uh, piece of equipment, and uh, just the factory voltage on it can already be uh, you know, around the, the, the regulated voltage it could be 4.9, could be 4.85, which is already kind of low. And once the capacitor goes or the bridge, you know, uh, shows signs of weakness, it, you hit both flippers, the voltage in here sags, and uh, the machine resets. Common problem. But the fix in this case is relatively easy. Throw the parts cannon at the 5 volts and you're up and running again. Now while looking at this, remember this, this was a... Uh, this machine was run in Japan and in Japan uh, you know, they, uh, they, the AC voltage is 100 volts and generally on uh, the Williams games you can repin this connector over here because the transformer is, a uh, uh, is an international kind that will basically work with 100 volts, 120, or 220, or 240. And by repinning this connector, you're basically feeding the different set of voltages into the uh, primary on this. And the secondary should all look the same. Now looking at this, it didn't look like anybody had ever repinned this. But there's some mounting holes over here. So what I think they originally did on this, and there's also another uh, another AC feed here. So what I think they did is they uh, put in a step-up transformer over there, a 100 to 110 or 100 to 120, and then took the secondary of that transformer and used it to drive this one. And if that trans that transformer may also have been under spec, which means you know it was resetting. I mean that thing was sagging too when it was drawing too much current. I don't know what the deal was. 
and to convert it back to U.S., they just ripped out that transformer over there and fed AC directly to this. Now, another thing, again, with the transformer I noticed was there was, well, there was buzzing coming from the speaker over here. But the interesting thing was the buzzing was only coming from this speaker and not from the two speakers in the back panel surrounding the uh, DMD display. And keep in, uh, keeping the fact in mind that basically the speakers, the uh, back speakers are wired uh, in parallel, but then those two speakers as a system are wired in series with this speaker. And what that really means, the only uh, interesting point here is, is that they're all getting the same signal, and the speakers in the DMD panel were not buzzing. Only this one was buzzing. And it sounded like 120 hertz. So to test it, I unplugged the uh, output from the soundboard, and the buzz persisted. So then I stuck my head in here, and the buzz wasn't coming from here. It's coming from the transformer. That usually means the laminates are, are vibrating, aren't tight enough. One thing I tried to do was tighten the screws that hold the laminates together. But uh, I guess he's getting old. The buzz isn't really that bad. You can't hear it when you play a game, but uh, this is probably something to watch. And whatever this did was probably contributed to the problem greatly in that it sagged more than normal whenever you had both flippers engaged, causing the reset. Well, the machine's on. I don't know how well you can hear it, but yeah, the speakers, not the speaker, the transformer's buzzing. I'm not going to stick the camera in there, take my word for it. It's doing 120 hertz. It's really not that bad at this distance, and when the, uh, when the play field's lowered and the glass is on, you can barely hear it. But it's still there. So things, uh, other than that, things look good, and uh, I think the time has almost come to playtest this guy, but I think I blabbered it enough for today, so what we're going to do is put the actual playtesting into the next episode, and then that way, for the people who don't want to see it played, they'll know to avoid the... Uh, the next episode, but for the people who do want to see it played, which should be the large majority of my viewers, the next uh, the next episode will deal with any other small issues, any other issues that crop up, and to see some games played on this, see if everything came back the way it should. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe, and leave me a comment. We'll see you soon.